Hey, welcome to the channel. In this video, we're gonna look at the abstract factory pattern and how it works in Ruby. My name is Caesar, and I've been using Ruby since 2008 to build all sorts of web applications, from small MVC-like apps to full-blown multi-million dollar ones. In the beginning, I used to hate it because every time I would change something, I would break some other parts of the app. And then every time I needed to add a new feature, guess what? I had to change some code and then eventually something else would break. So I got really frustrated about this and started to look into how to solve both of these problems. And I eventually discovered that the solution to problem number one, i.e. not breaking stuff whenever you change code, is to test it really well using strong automated testing practices. But that's not as easy as it may sound. It took me years to fully master this process. By the way, if you're interested in how to do that and not spend years discovering it by yourself through trial and error, check out my book Bulletproof Ruby on Rails Applications, which I've linked in the description below. Now, going back to problem number two, i.e. adding new features to your app without changing too much code, is to design it really well. And that's where today's pattern comes in. What the abstract factory allows you to do is to isolate conditional instantiations of related objects so that your client code can be extended without changing it. So let's look at some code. I've got a lot of code here, so don't worry, I'm gonna explain all of it. I wanna show you how we're going to use it, so let's look at the client code first. This is basically how you're going to use your abstract factory from somewhere, for example, from an endpoint. I'm modeling a furniture store website where you might have a furniture category that you want to filter your products on. In this particular example, I left out the part where you get the category from a user submitted form and you dynamically create the factory based on that. Here, we're building the factories by hand. So you can see I'm trying out both a modern category by creating a modern furniture factory and the vintage category by creating a vintage furniture factory. Once I have the factory, I give it to the client code method and it will call create chair and create table on that factory object. The most important thing to note here is that the client code method can support an unlimited number of factories as long as they respond to the create chair and create table methods. This is important because this is how you can extend your code without changing it. It's called the open close principle which says classes should be open for extension and closed for modification. So, this client code method can be extended by adding new categories of furniture without changing anything inside of it, because the changes we need to make are outside of this client code method. Maybe this doesn't look like a big deal, but imagine if the client code method or a similar logic was used 20 times throughout your code base. Whenever you had to add a new category, you'd had to update all of the 20 places to use the new category. So I hope you can see how applying the abstract factory pattern to the client code method can make it more extendable. Now, let's see how it works. If we take a look at the modern furniture factory class and the vintage furniture factory class, we can see they both implement the same methods, namely create chair and create table. They have to, because otherwise the client code method wouldn't work. And we can even enforce that all of these factory classes implement those methods by making them inherit from a base class that raises when those methods are called. So the subclass, i.e. the modern furniture factory class and the vintage furniture factory class have to override those two methods. It's not required to have that base class because you'll get an undefined method error if you call methods that don't exist, but it's good to have it as documentation for other developers. Another way you could achieve the same goal is to use a shared test to make sure that all these factory classes respond to the same methods. Okay, moving on. We can now look at how those methods work. In the case of the modern furniture factory class, the createChair method returns a modern chair object, and the createTable method returns a modern table object. Similarly, the create chair method for the vintage furniture factory class returns a vintage chair object, and the create table method returns a vintage table object. As you can see, the type of objects you get back is determined by the class of the factory, as opposed to the factory method pattern where the object you get back is determined by a method. If you're not familiar with the factory method, check out my factory method pattern video, which I'm going to link in the description. 
Now, if we look at the modern chair and modern table classes, or the vintage chair and the vintage table classes, we can see they too have to respect a contract or an interface. In other words, they need to respond to the same methods. Otherwise, the client code that uses them will raise an exception if it cannot call those methods on all the different types of objects. And again, you have the option to use a base class, or parent class if you want to call it that, or you can enforce it via shared tests. So if we look at this entire file, we can see that we basically have two different kinds of furniture and we can programmatically use either one. By determining the category, we can create a factory object based on that category and that factory object can create products in that specific category. All of this code lives in one big file because it's easier for you to see the whole picture. But if we want to put it in different files and folders, it would probably look like this. In the lib folder here, I have an endpoint class that is the top entry point. It's got a category method that receives some params, and the params refer to the request params. Depending on what web framework you're using, you probably have a slightly different way of accessing the params. But it's going to be a hash like the one illustrated here. And so you'll get access to that params hash in some form or another, at which point you can extract the category out of it and create your factory object. The simplest and less flexible option is to use the if-else statement and create a factory like this. But if you know how the factory method pattern works, you can replace that conditional with a call to a method, like this. And here's how that method looks like. It takes the category and it tries to determine the class name based on it, and if it cannot find a class, it falls back to the regular factory class. Each category has its own folder now that holds a factory for the category and its products. There's also a products folder which holds the interfaces or the base classes for the products. The base class for all the factories lives in this base file. So let's run this endpoint category method to see what it does. I've set the category in the params hash to vintage, and then I'm calling the category method and I'm passing in the params hash. As you can see, it prints chair has one legs and no cushion. Table is made of wood. Because those are the properties defined in the vintage chair object and the vintage table object. But if we change the category to modern, we'll see a different message. And lastly, if we put regular in the category or we put a category that doesn't exist, we'll get the message corresponding to the regular objects. So there you have it, that is the abstract factory pattern in Ruby. I hope that helped and if you're interested in learning more about Ruby, don't forget to subscribe to the channel because I'll be posting a lot more videos just like this one. Bye!